towards our next session on how TBT notifications are responded. Discussion on the response on TBT regulation in India. We have with us Mr. Ashish Chandra, partner DSK Legal. Mr. Ashish Chandra sir practices in the arena of customs international trade WTO. He has extensive experience in WTO dispute settlements, proceedings wherein he represented the government of India as the lead counsel before a WTO panel in its first com uh, compliance proceedings under Article 21.5 of the Dispute uh, Settlement Understanding as, as well as India's first and only arbitration proceedings uh, under Article 22.6 of Dispute Settlement Understanding. Here, he was also India's lead counsel in the appeal before the WTO appellate body in appeal number WTDS 430. Additionally, Mr. Chandra Sir has also extensively advised various government organized departments in India as well as foreign governments and private organizations on issues concerning WTO covered agreements, foreign trade policies, rules of origin, free trade agreements, custom related issues, issues concerning food safety and standard authority of India and Bureau of Indian Standards. Mr. Chandrasar also regularly represents clients in trade remedial investigations such as anti-dumping duty, countervailing duty and safeguard duty investigation before the Directorate General Trade Remedies as well as before the appellate forum such as Honorable Supreme Court of India, High Court and the Honorable Custom Excise and Service Tax Appellate Tribunal. He has also represented India Expo, Indian exporters in trade remedial investigations initiated by other jurisdictions including the US International Trade Commission and the European Commission and has also advised the government of India on countervailing duty investigation initiated by other countries against India. Now I would like to request Mr. Chandrasar. Thank you for the kind introduction. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Ashish Chandra. I am a partner at DSK Legal where I look into the issues of customs and international trade. Uh, <clears throat> the purpose of this presentation, you know, we already have a broad discussion in our previous sessions with respect to TBT standards and thereof. The purpose of this particular presentation is to highlight how these TBT standards can, you know, be a useful uh, tool to respond and make an advantage uh, by clarifying those TBT standards and by getting more information. So we'll uh, briefly highlight how those processes go by, uh, especially in the context of India. There would be few overlaps in terms of provisions which I would presume you may have already covered in the previous session or you probably would be covering in the sessions uh, going forward, but that is just for the purpose of reference and that will not be covered in detail. So I'll just briefly start with my presentation. So first of all, is the TBT agreement we are referring to part of uh, your round of multilateral trade negotiations where multiple other agreements were also uh, entered into a force. Uh, we have already discussed, I think in the previous session, these broad principles and the TBT agreement, I will not be repeating again. I think we will again have a broad discussion tomorrow on these principles, so no point going on these. Now, one of the first, uh, these are the key provisions of the TBT agreement for the purpose of our discussion. Now, in the TBT agreement, as we have already referred, in terms of international standards, now what TBT agreement provides in these provisions is how TBT notifications should be shared with other member countries, should be shared within, uh, you know, in terms of technical knowledge, in terms of technical provisions, in terms of technical information, how those information needs to be shared between member countries. The purpose of this sharing is very, very simple. 
to ensure that there is complete transparency, to ensure that all the relevant information is shared with all the member countries so they would be in a position to provide their informed comments with basis which you can further modify those measures and then come into force a measure which would probably be a DMT compliance measure and taking into account the concerns of other member countries. So these briefly are some of those provisions. I will not be going for detail because they may be again discussed later, but referring to Article 2.9 of the TBT agreement, there is some uh, provisions there in the TBT agreement with respect to how those uh, technical regulations need to be shared with other countries if there are no international standards or if the international standards are not really applicable to your measure. Similarly, in the 2.10, which is kind of an exception to 2.9. You can have a measure without referring and following the process under 2.9. Similarly, you have an obligation under 2.11, which respect to sharing all the information with other countries and so on. Then you have some obligations under Article 5 of the TBT agreement. With basically, Article 5 discusses about conformity assessment and the provisions therein and the processes, how you will follow those processes. Then you have some obligations under Article 10 with respect to inquiry points and you have also some obligations under Annex 3 of the TBT agreement which basically talks about good practices which your body, which is a standardization body which needs to be followed. So these are the broad processes in terms of the TBT agreement and that probably will be lifting in, slide, <coughs> in the slides going forward. Again, recapturing those provisions for your reference. Now, I'll just be referring to a couple of cases uh, because they have a direct impact on what we were discussing. Now, I think in the previous session, it was already mentioned about the US flow of cigarettes. And uh, the reason I'm referring to this in the US flow of cigarettes is that in the US flow of cigarettes, the uh, respondent country, US, was accused of not notifying its measure in accordance with the TBT agreement and the uh, Indonesia in its complaint raised this issue and the panel found that the US has acted inconsistently with Article 2.9.2 by failing to notify the technical regulations at issue. So, you know, the idea behind highlighting this particular case law is to just tell you that these uh, inconsistencies or violations can also be raised at the WTO dispute level at the WTO activity committee level and therefore these issues need to be looked into from a serious perspective while complying with these requirements. Similarly, there was a violation of an Article 2.9.3 as well uh, in this particular dispute. Now, <clears throat> there's one more aspect here that in this case, the applicant body not only looked at the TBT agreement, they also looked at the Doha ministerial decision and they basically interpreted that decision as part of TBT agreement by applying Article 31.3a of the Vienna Convention of uh, Interpretation of the Term Reasonable Interval. So, in terms of applicability of other kind of provisions to the TBT agreement, there is also a scope in these kind of disputes. So, they also need to be looked into. <coughs> in terms of a life cycle of a TBT measure, now this is probably the sequence, uh, this is taken from a WTO uh, uh, kind of a presentation which is available online which really captures the entire uh, life cycle very well. So you have a measure which is proposed, uh, which then it can be published if there is a requirement domestically, then it is shared with other members, provision of uh, copies being made available to other members, discussion on the comments because there is a requirement to uh, have comments from other member countries, end of comment period, adoption of the measure, publication of the measure and entry into force and you will see that there is a certain timeline mentioned in terms of 60 days and 6 months which needs to be abided by. Now transparency obligations, I know transparency is a separate uh, session tomorrow afternoon so I will not go into detail but in terms of transparency obligations, why is the need of transparency? Uh, basic points, access to accurate and relevant information on regulations, reducing cost of compliance for business because if you have the right information to comply, the, you will be easily able to comply and predictability and stability of the entire trading system which is also part of the WTO agreement. 
Now there are two different aspects of transparency applic obligations. One is by early engagement of stakeholders. This would be your domestic stakeholders as well as the other member countries. So the moment you uh, notify your draft measure, you will be have engagement from other uh, different stakeholders in terms of domestic companies, uh, associations, or other member countries. And the other one is this, uh, facilitate access to information for all members. Now, with respect to this particular aspect, each country under the TMT agreement is required to have an inquiry point under Article 10 of the TMT agreement. Now, in India, there are two uh, inquiry points, BIS and TEC, which basically takes care of all the technical regulations and you know, uh, serve as a single point source for providing any kind of information on India's TBT issues. <clears throat> now, how would you go about responding to TBT notifications? First of all, there would be a draft measure. This draft measure would be pursuant to some internal discussions in the ministries, would be pursuant to some requirement, uh, uh, could be because of some issues being faced by exporters or things like that. So once you have a draft measure in place, you will probably be publishing it. There are certain aspects or certain uh, scenarios where those draft measures are required to be published in the official gadget. Sometimes you can simply publish it for comments to the general public. So depending upon the requirement, you will publish it uh, in your own country. And you will also share this draft requirement, uh, draft, sorry, draft notification with uh, other member countries through the TBT committee. So you will be sending this particular data format uh, where you will be mentioning all the details including the details of the inquiry point which is applicable for this measure. Uh, giving information as to whom can be contacted if there is any clarification which can be sought on these draft measures and then you will share it with the DBT uh, committee which will be further submitted to all the members and then the process starts. So in terms of uh, there is a minimum requirement for 60 day comment basically meaning that once the notification has been shared with other countries you have to give them a minimum timeline of 60 days. So you cannot mention in your notification draft notification that you have to share your comments in less than 60 days. For example, BIS provides 90 days. So this kind of preparation needs to be looked into. Then once the comment is received, basically you have to, it's always advisable to acknowledge receive these comments. Okay, uh, before I go ahead, these comments can will probably be coming to you bilaterally. So in the sense that the inquiry point which you have mentioned in your draft measure, those inquiry points would likely be receiving those comments from member countries. So, it, uh, so you have to ensure that those inquiry points and the email IDs and the postal addresses which you have mentioned is actually functional and you know kept on the uh, into the directory so that you will be able to identify those comments and once those comments are received, it's always advisable. I would say the good practice, not legally mandatory, but advisable and uh, in terms of acknowledging those comments from other member countries and if there's a requirement to share some kind of technical regulation, technical measures, if the countries have asked for it, it's always uh, advisable to share such kind of measures with other countries. Now, <clears throat> once those uh, comments have come into your domain, what you need to do is discuss that with all the stakeholders. Now, my, from my own uh, practical perspective, and, and we have dealt with some of the SPS issues on this point, not directly on the DMT, but the process will be the same. Once you have received those comments from different member countries, and it could be comments even from your own domestic stakeholders, you would be discussing them with various technical experts, you would be discussing them from a legal point of view, you could be discussing them from your uh, policy point of view. What kind of policies would we like to have? If all the comments may be legally compliant, may not be really as per your policy objective. So it's very important to have a wide discussion on those kind of comments, what comment you would like to entertain and retain as part of your measure or what comment you will not like to retain because there is also a, could be a requirement that a member country who has shared these comments with you may ask that why these comments have not been incorporated. It's of course, of course issue of bilateral, uh, uh, bilateral communication where they can ask these questions and it's always in good faith you can respond to these questions as to how, you know why the reasons you have not kind of kept these comments into consideration and in the final measure. Now, if you do not respond to these comments, if you do not uh, take these comments into consideration at all, the TBT committee, the, the, those countries can always raise it as an issue of concern and there will be discussions where India will be obligated to respond. The response will depend upon what you want to say, but there would be issues raised in the TBT committee. 
Now, inquiry point role. Now, inquiry point plays a very, very important role in all this function because, as I mentioned earlier, it's the inquiry point which will receive this kind of inf uh, comments from other countries, and they will be the single point of communication. So, it's important that inquiry point uh, consists of those people who actually have a good, good, good understanding of the entire measure at issue for which the uh, draft has been circulated. <laughs> So they should be knowledgeable about the members' participation in international and regional stand, uh, standardization bodies, conformity assessment systems, as well as bilateral agreements. And basically the idea is that you should have a 360 degree view of the entire process. You know, sometimes it is often seen that you know, you are taking a position of one nature in a particular communication in a bilateral negotiation and you may take, uh, end up taking a different position altogether in a multilateral negotiation. That's always advisable. So it's important to have an entire 360 degree view of the position you are trying to take, and therefore the member, uh, the inquiry point members who are you know handling those kind of inquiry point, they should be very well knowledgeable about the entire position, not only from a technical point of view, even from the legal and the policy point of view. Very simple uh, points in terms of coordination with trade officials, regulators, standardization bodies, industry. <coughs> And uh, of course, all measures uh, need to be complied and you know, uh, notified to the TBT committee. And whenever there is a confusion, you, as I mentioned in the previous session, please uh, mention both TBT and SPS, and you can notify to both the committees just to ensure that there is no confusion. Uh, again, uh, coordination between various government uh, government bodies. Now, this is one aspect where you till now what we, just, what we have been discussing is about how the Indian measure, you know, there would be QDs from other countries and how we would be responding to such kind of measures, what the processes, brief processes would be there in terms of, or, you know, dealing with such kind of QDs. There's also another aspect in terms of measures which you will be receiving uh, of other countries and which could be of important trade concern for you because you could have a very important trade interest in such products in such countries. So it's not only really important to keep abreast of your own measure, the inquiry point plays a very, very important role in making an, uh, a, a kind of a database for measures from other countries which could have a significant trade impact on your own export interest. So therefore, as and when you receive those kind of notifications from WTO committees uh, through your inquiry points or other points, it's important to respond to those kind of notifications and regulations because in my experience, in, there have been instances where India as a country has not responded to some of these notifications within time. Those notifications were adopted and then you're playing a follow-up game in terms of, you know, discussing with those countries how well we can address your trade concern. So there are issues which we need to look into, uh, look into this and the prompt response and prompt comments on these aspects are very, very helpful. So how would you do that? Again, the very simple process, nothing uh, scientific here. Inquiry points should uh, disseminate information about other trading partner measures, prompt outreach to domestic stakeholders. So for example, if there is a measure which you receive from other country which would impact a particular sector or product, you would ideally reach out to the association concerned, you would ideally reach out to the state governments where those companies are based, uh, those companies themselves. Uh, you could be reaching out the line ministry if there is a particular line ministry for that product. So all of these are important uh, outreach because then only you will be able to get the right kind of information about that particular proposed measure of the other country and then you will be able to give an informed comment on those kind of measures. And these are some of the explanations which you can you know, seek uh, from the other country in terms of the ultimate objective if there is a deviation from international standards, why there is a uh, deviation, the reasons thereof, seek expert comments domestically, seek extension to provide comments if required. I think these are the brief comments. If anybody has any questions, then, then I must be here or maybe I'm All right, thank you so much. See, you can always skip those responses. There is no obligation upon you to completely take that comment into consideration and apply that. Ultimately, it's your sovereign right to disregard that comment. 
but it would be advisable to inform the country if that country would ask you a question that why their concerns and comments are not being taken into consideration. And there have been occasions, especially on the SPS process, as I recall, we have done that. Where we have informed those countries where from whom we have received those comments that these are the reasons, especially when they started with a request from our side why their comments were not incorporated. And we have informed them that these are the reasons why we thought, you know, we have not, not of course going to very detailed, but a broad kind of an indication is very, very helpful. Because ultimately these communications are done in kind of good faith. You know, tomorrow it's your measure, sometimes they will be their measure. If they would not be giving you those kind of details, you would also be the fix. So these communications are done in good faith. Good faith is a very important principle of uh, government agreements under WTO. So it's advisable to enter into these kind of communications. <laughs> Hmm. Yes. So, yeah, that's a very good question. So, what will happen is that if you receive a draft notification in some other language, the, that draft notification would ideally have the details of the inquiry point. So, you can communicate to the inquiry point saying that this particular uh, notification is from other language. Ideally, the WTO regulations require that if you are sharing a notification in languages other than the, 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 the official language of uh, WTO, you will also be required to share a translated version, ideally. But even if it is not there, you can always communicate to the inquiry point saying that you will require a you know, version in English for that matter. Even if that is not coming in, what we can in practical sense is that we always reach out to TMI. But I think the case of SPS, so I I I don't I am not giving you that there is no problem. There is always a problem in terms of getting those uh, notifications in time, getting those notifications in, in the correct language. That's why I mentioned ideally it should be done. Many a times it is not done. You reach out to the inquiry point. If that is not also helping you, you the best and the easiest way I have always found out is to reach out to the PMI. So there, so yeah, so there is there are three official languages of WTO: English, German, and uh, French. So, so there is Spanish, Spanish, sorry, English, French, and Spanish. Yeah, so so there is that is that ideally it should be made available in one of the official languages. But for some reason, if they have not been made available, may, because it may happen that the version which would reach the inquiry point may not be the same language which would have been given to the secretariat or the committee. Sometimes these overlaps may happen. So the best way is to reach out to the inquiry point. You will have your commercial attaches in those countries. You can always reach out to the commercial, uh, you know, the person uh, in the Indian embassy in that country to get the official version. You can reach out to the PMI to get the right version. So this is the way in which you can resolve this issue. But yes, there are practical aspects where problems have been faced. That's absolutely right. Inviting an additional access. Yes, it is. It is, and it has been an issue. But yeah, that is one of the ways you can resolve this. Sir, uh, regarding that uh, notification, draft notification minimum 60 days, and you have clearly mentioned that BIS, our Indian uh, counterpart, provides 90 days. Right. However, when we talk about uh, the comments and the uh, asking for the comments, uh -huh. you have written in your presentation reasonable amount of time for explanation. So, in general, by your particular uh, means, uh, uh, in, in this, could you just let us know uh, that in general, in how many days? Such explanation used to come. Uh, you mean explanation to the other country why their comments have not been yes. involved? See, ideally, means there is no timeline to be fixed because it's only a bilateral communication and good faith between you and the other member country. The uh, advisory, it will always be advisable to be like as early as possible. We have done, uh, I have seen, you know, that happening in around say week or 10 days in terms of responding to other countries because the idea should be that you are responding. At the same time, you should be responding in the manner which would be in uh, accordance with your policy. You would not like to give too much of information as to why you have not done that in detail. But the final response should in, uh, ensure that the other country should get an indication as to why the comment has not been incorporated. So there is no timeline fix, the earlier the better, but maybe week 10 days that could be looked into from you know the adding perspective. Sir, sir, 
Uh, with your experience, you can tell any examples where at the preliminary notice stage itself, if the comments are made or uh, responses are given and that is accepted and it was not implemented. In terms of in the final measure? Oh, yeah. So you were saying that draft notification was calculated, comments were received. Yes. And then? Oh, if they are subjected or something like that, then it was not notified. Is there any specific examples? So, see, you already, uh, just to clarify, so you already have a draft measure in place. You want to implement that draft measure after maybe a you know, few months once the comment period is over. The only question is the comments of the other member countries, whether they will be incorporated or not. So I do not want see a situation where your own, you will not be notifying your own measure. You can do that, hypothetically speaking, because tomorrow you will feel that it will not be in accordance with your policy perspective. Nothing that I can recall myself from my experience because typically the whole purpose of sending this to the committees is to get the response and implement the measure at the earliest. That's the whole purpose. Legally, there is no stopping you. You can always decide after the comments not to implement the measure and not do anything with that. That is within your domain and within your discretion. But typically, that may not happen because of the whole purpose of the entire exercise. If it is with the comments to other countries, but you are telling about implementation by the India, yes, not getting a response. Yes. Examples where the responses are given to other countries and uh -huh. they have uh, not. So, given. India has given response comments for the countries and they have not really taken it back. That happens many a times. That has happened in many a times. Um, you know, it depends basically about. So, there are, you know, trading blocks, I will not mention them explicitly, where, you know, they think that they, you know, the way they, their approach is that is the best approach. So, but the idea is that, you know, you, to be very honest, the reason for this and the way I see this, you are building a case for yourself. Okay, why you do this? Because tomorrow if you have the to be a dispute and there are happy disputes oh, this will be helpful. Yeah, this would be helpful. In fact, in flow secret, if I recall, Indonesia actually mentioned that they have given these comments during the measure itself. So all these aspects are then taken into consideration. So what you're doing as a uh, you know from a legal perspective is building a case for yourself. That we have shared our concern at the very beginning. Now the other country did not take that concern into uh, consideration, and that's why we are coming here. And the other country cannot take an excuse that we were not aware of this issue. Excuse me, sir, this way. Here, here. Oh, sorry. Sir, so, add on to the previous uh, question. Like, uh, supposing we do not accept the measure, we do not implement it, and we give a proper justification. So, will that disrupt the trade between the two countries? If you are not implementing the measure, then it will be status quo. Not implementing the measure is your discretion. So there will be status quo and you can just move on with everything that you would like it was. Basically, when there is a measure is getting introduced, there is a new element coming into between, right, in terms of trade. That is when member countries will get concerned. You know, what is this measure all about? If you decide after, at the end of the entire exercise not to implement the measure for whatever purpose, and those purposes and the reasons need not be even shared with other countries. Ultimately, as a sovereign member, as a sovereign country, it's your right and discretion. So it will be status quo and nothing will happen. Maybe just thank you very much for that interesting presentation. Just one small sure. comment to, to some that your answer to the, the question here from the about translations. Um, and we'll be going to this more detail tomorrow and Wednesday, but so the obligation in, in terms of WTO languages covers the notifications part. So it has to come in one of the three official languages, English, French, or Spanish, uh, as she rightly pointed out. Now the question is what happens maybe with um, the actual text of the measure if, if, if that measure comes from another language, let's say Portuguese, let's say it's a Brazilian measure. So that measure, of course, will be adopted in Portuguese, enacted. Um, so there is no obligation per se to, to translate that for the country itself. But as, as we've been saying, the committee over the 25 years of work has tried to expand you know, transparency good practices in this area significantly. So what we are seeing currently, more and more, is that through the use of 
an online tool that is called Epic. We'll explain it in detail. Members that perform an informal translation of a measure can share that translation with all the WTO members and with their exporters. So in this, in this, uh, on this tool, Epic, there, there is an international forum in which you can find notifications. And let's say we have this Brazilian measure that comes in Portuguese, and some country, let's say the United States, has translated it into English. Where we are starting to see more and more that the country that performs the translation then shares that translation, which is informal, of course, but can nonetheless be helpful for trading partners and exporters. So maybe that's one way in which, even though the obligations only go so far, practice and good practices are going further towards more transparency. Thank you. Thank you. I just had a clarification. But as far as developed countries are concerned, they are under an obligation to provide the base document of the notification, right? And if it's voluminous documents, then summaries as per 10.5, if I'm not mistaken. If the question. I think, but well, I would have to check, but I think the obligation is um, that developed countries, that they have to provide at least the summary. <coughs> in one of the three official languages of the regulation. But we are not obliged to provide the full regulatory text in one of the three languages. I, I think the language used in the case of voluminous documents summaries, but I mean, what is voluminous of course? Yeah. In practice, I think what has happened is that they are providing summaries of, in one of the three languages. If they're entry not sense a notification, uh, implements the final notification. Yes. And if they make amendments in that frequently, whether it should be notified or not. I tell you, you should always remember that's kind of a changing the previous measure. So after let's say some time you are making those changes in the existing measure, you will notify that. The same procedure, 60 days, 6 months. Uh, it will depend if it, what kind of uh, like amendment is there. That is, in my understanding, if it's a very small uh, amendment, you may not do that because this is basically from a perspective of a new measure where you would include some changes. So de there can be some procedural issues also which you want to amend. So depending upon the, uh, the proposed amendment, that we will see. But in terms of notification, once that amendment has been done, because there's also one provision 2.10, where it provides that if there is immediate requirement of making those, uh, you know, introducing new kind of measures, you may skip all those requirements at 2.9. So you can always fall back upon that and, you know, introduce all those changes and then share all the uh, amendments with the member countries. Thank you, Asish, sir. Uh, now I would like to request